Good morning, everyone. I'm Captain Warren with the Hickory Fire Department, and this is my crew, Robert Lovell and Jonathan Holton. And we're here to talk about ecosystems with this STEM lab. Now, how that pertains to us is wildfires and how we try to stop and prevent wildfires so that it does not mess up the, the local ecosystem. You can see here in itself where we have our uh, hardwoods and our softwoods such as pine and our evergreens. The trees are up here but when you get closer to the water here we have our ferns and we have our mosses. And so th there's a transition just in the plants itself in this small area due to where the water resource is. And of course, you know, we talk about ecosystems, terrestrial is land ecosystems and aquatic is water. And uh, we're gonna talk about both of those a little bit today. And uh, so what we have here, as you can see, there's been some storm damage and we have a, a lot of kennel in here. It's been sitting here, it's been drying for a while. Now, it has advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is when trees fall like this, it makes habitats for the local wildlife. But when they sit here for a long time and you have a, a lot of storm damage and trees down from, from ice storms or tornadoes, it also builds a, a higher fire load. And, uh, but Mother Nature, you know, does everything for a reason. So if a wildfire were to happen, it could risk uh, the community homes we've you've all seen them on tv out uh out west in california where they they the wildfires come with the santa Ana winds and they go up on homes and they'll, they'll destroy property um and also the animals that destroys their habitat because one it's bad because it messes up the the food web But on the same note, it also helps uh, restore the, the, the land so it can restart everything uh, to put the nutrients back in, start fresh life. And uh, it also helps eliminate disease from overpopulation. And disease can come in uh, trees and plants and make them weak and uh, with age. And disease also can come with overpopulation in the wildlife. And so a lot of times these, these wildfires, they will also help reset the ecosystem in that area. Um, so there is good and there is bad, but what we're going to talk about today are things that we do to help control or stop wildfires. Um, and so Jonathan, who has more experience with wildfire, is going to lead us into the discussion. Okay, so what we're going to do here is, uh, me and Lovell is actually going to show you, say one side of the trail is burning, we're actually going to cut a line down through here. So what we're gonna do, Lovell's gonna take this uh, fire rake. Um, he can use that to dig in the dirt. He can use it to uh, trim limbs off the trees. So he's gonna scratch a line. He takes all the leaves and material, dry material, away from it. He's raking it away from the fire. The fire's on that side. All right. And I would come by and clean it on down. 
make sure there's no debris that can burn, no material. Get it all the way down to the dirt. Now, one of the things we talk about the engineering aspect of STEM is another method that they will use, and this is a good method, but you'll also see they'll use blowers. Correct. And they'll, they'll take a leaf blower and they'll run across the fire line. Right. You take the blower, and that's a good, good point. Um, it's a mechanical way, saves a lot of energy. He can take a blower and then blow this line, get all he can, and then we'll come back with rakes and plastics uh, and matics and clean it off and make it even better. Just so the material don't burn. Um, other ways to um, stop the fire is um, we would actually contact the North Carolina Forestry Service if it was a major fire. They would, um, they have the resources of helicopters, uh, wildland crews, um, dozers, and things like that, that to actually uh, mitigate the problem and make it a little better, or easier than manual labor. Now, you talk about uh, earth and, and the different um, biomes. If you look here, you also have the topography of the land as well. And we talk about wind and you have wind driven fires. Well, one thing you can try not to be uphill uh, downwind because what would happen is if the fire was burning and you were up the hill, well, we obviously know heat rises. Uh, you know, you spoke earlier in your classes about conduction, convection, and radiation. Well, when you have a, a large wire. Wildfire, you actually have all three. You're going to have uh, conduction because you're going to have direct flame impingement where it's going to spread. You're going to have convection from the, the heated smoke and gases, and you're going to have radiation. It's going to be coming off the fire itself, and it's going to start raising the temperature of the other materials to help the fire spread. Well, then when you introduce the wind and the topography where it's going up, it can cause the fire to advance rapidly, uh, which can endanger firefighters' lives as well. Correct. As we fight the fire going up the hill, the fire's flowing up the hill. We would flank the fire on both sides of it. Um, working a line just like we did here. We would work a line on that side, work a line on that side, and work our way to the head of the fire and eventually get in front of it where we could stop it. Okay, now talking about ecosystems again, uh, us in North Carolina, we are very fortunate because we have a nice change in all of the land in North Carolina. You go from the coast to the sand hills to the Piedmont to the foothills to the mountains. 
Um, we are a deciduous forest, as you can see here. You can see where our trees lose their leaves as far as our ecosystem. Uh, One thing that a lot of people tend to forget is the Appalachian Mountains and the, where the Smoky Mountains and that, that area, it's, uh, it is a temperate rainforest. So when you go and they say, oh, you know, the Great Smoky Mountains, what people don't realize is yes, that, that's a lot of fog and low lying clouds, uh, but it actually gets enough rainfall and there's enough moisture that it's considered a, a temperate rainforest. So uh, keep that in mind next time you go to the mountains. We know North Carolina has temperate rainforest in the Appalachian Mountain area. And, and why is that important? Well, when it comes to wildfires, we talk about humidity, okay? And we have four seasons, and depending on the season, like right now it's spring, and you can see it's starting to uh, green up, and, and the sap is coming up in the trees. And we've had a lot of storms here lately, so our humidity's high, the, the trees are, and the, the plants are more moist, so the fire hazard is gonna be lower. Um, Obviously, in the summertime or out west, when we have these droughts, the fire uh, risk is going to be a lot higher. And what you'll see is the state will put out uh, burn bans and notifications to let you know that you can't have any any burns, uh, campfires or or uh, brush fires where you clean up your yard because either high winds are uh, going to affect the weather. Um, and the risk or the drought or both. Um, so these are all factors that come into play um, with wildfires is um, th there's many aspects with the weather and, and how it comes to play. And another example is uh, severe thunderstorms, lightning. Lightning comes down and hit, it could be what triggers and starts the, uh, the wildfire itself. Or it could be, um, it could be a human factor it could have been someone who, who let a campfire get out of control and it started the fire. So that, that would be the human impact example uh, on the ecosystem when it comes to wildfires. And the other human impact would be us uh, stopping or, or helping control the wildfire. We're gonna talk about campfires, all right? So if you're camping in the woods or in your backyard even, all right, you build a campfire. Do you ever wanna leave it unattended? No. You want to make sure before you leave that it's out properly. Um, you can use dirt to put on it and put it out. You can take water from a creek or your house and put it out. Um, just never leave a campfire unattended. The wind can get up and then it can jump to another wooded area and get away from you. Um, also, matches, all right? So, do kids need to play with matches? No. Um, I only use matches in supervision of an adult. So we're going to talk about a couple of the tools here uh, we've got with us today. Um, we've got a mattock here. All right, it's got a digging in right here for digging. Yeah, you can dig dirt, a pick. You can go in and pull rocks out of the way or move them. Um, got another tool here, which is a fire rake. It's a certain kind of tool, just made for firefighting, but it's got sharp teeth on it. On both sides, it's real sharp there. And uh, it's used for cutting. You can actually take limbs off a tree with it. You can, you can dig, yep, it'll take limbs off. You can dig fire line with it, break the dirt, get it back. Um, say you, you've got a fire here, it's burning on the side. You can take that rake and um, cover it with dirt. Yep, so he's smothering the fire out taking the oxygen away from the fire and the fire will go out. He just covered it with dirt, fire went out. There's between a woods fire and a house fire, all right? We go to house fires all the time. Don't have that many woods fires, but when you go to a woods fire, 
um, the difference is, you know, a house is contained. It's in a box usually. You know, you got 1,500, 2,000 square feet versus acres and acres of forest that the wildfire could go. The wind could drive the fire. It could burn 10 acres in a matter of minutes. Okay, as we continue to discuss ecosystems in this STEM lab, we also do uh, hazardous material uh, control or containment. Now, what I'm going to show you here is, of course, you have your terrestrial and then you have your aquatic. Well, human impact, when we have like a, a fuel spill or, or any substance that's not supposed to be in that place, it's not natural, um, we try to limit the impact on that. And to give you a prime example, most people think about oil and gasoline other chemicals in the water uh, but something as simple as milk you know if, if a milk truck were to overturn and milk were to get into the to the uh, the river basin or the stream basin it would actually be deadly to the aquatic life uh, even though it's a natural material but it's out of place so what I have here is um, a guest speaker and um, he's going to help us with this scenario and give y'all some more insight. But this is Wes, you come on down. This is firefighter Wes Blackwelder. He actually works on A shift. Uh, he got off duty this morning. And uh, he is also Catawba County's uh, EEM hazmat coordinator currently. And uh, Wes was nice enough to bring the, uh, the county hazmat truck. And we're going to review it here in a little bit. But he's going to walk us through some of this uh, runoff and, and hazardous material control. Good morning. So as Captain Warren mentioned, uh, talking about river basins and stream basins, uh, the, the chemicals uh, when they're spilled from whatever container that they're in, our goal is to try to contain them as quickly as possible, either in the container or if it gets outside of its container before it gets into the mechanisms or the pathways that it gets to the stream beds, whether it be a manhole. Or a storm drain, we try to use those things to capture it before it gets to those. Not always are we able to get it before they get to those. And if it does get here an impact, as Captain Warren mentioned, it can have some damaging impacts, uh, short term and long term on the ecosystems in the aquatic uh, areas as well as the terrestrial areas. So one of the ways that we can control that is either by catching it before it gets to the storm drain, and we'll show, show you that at a later, at a later time. Uh, but what we're going to show you here and talk about is once it does get into the stream, the goal is to, depending on how much volume of water is there, how fast it's flowing, we need to get ahead of it so that we can capture it before it does any further damage or get further downstream. One of the ways that we do that is by building either a dam, which with, if we build a dam, just like it, many kids playing in, in the woods uh, and, and build, build dams, it's much the same concept. But the problem is with just a dam, at some point as the water backs up behind the dam, it's soon gonna overflow that. So one of the ways that we need to do this is to capture the flow, the volume of the stream so that we can keep the product behind. So depending on how we do that is based on the weight of that product. And that term is the specific gravity. Okay, so when we talk about the acronym STEM, E is for engineering. So when we go to build this, this land dam, what we're gonna do is we want to use everything to our advantage. Well, one, you can see here where the rapid movement is the water, so we're gonna to have to calculate how far ahead we need to get. But if you look here, we can take this rock and all the water is funneling here in this area. So to make a quicker build, what we'll do is we can use rocks to go ahead and put in position and then they'll begin to shovel the dirt to make the, the land dam. And uh, as Wes was talking about earlier, depending on the specific gravity of the chemical in relation to the water would be how you would tilt to get to your clean water. Obviously, when you build your dam, if the 
the chemical is heavier than water, your clean water is going to float. So you would put your pipe like this so the clean water would skim off the top and then go on downstream. If the chemical is lighter than water, then once we build the dam, you would turn your pipe here so all the clean water would come in from the bottom and out the top and all the contaminants would stay on, on, on the dam side. So that's kind of the engineering aspect of what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to get started right now and these gentlemen are going to go ahead and start building our land dam. All right, so here we have what's referred to as an underflow dam. The product that we're dealing with would be a lighter than water product. It's going to remain on the surface. The leaves here are acting as our contaminant today. Uh, you see them floating on the surface. Again, you see the good, we've got good water flow uh, coming off the bottom of the pool. At some point, depending on how much volume of chemical we have coming down, Eventually this is going to become oversaturated. So this may not be the only area that we would do. We may have to go on downstream and build another area uh, as a, as a catch-all. Uh, but here, as the product is collecting here on the surface, one of the ways that we can help uh, keep it from oversaturating is take a spill pad, lay it on the surface. The spill pad is designed not to absorb water, but to absorb the product itself. So we can put as many of these as we need to on there to help absorb that product. Once they become full, we can take them off uh, as safely as we can without getting into the product and place new ones down on top of it. You see here, we've changed the angle of the pipe. Uh, again, looking at the engineering side of it. Now we're dealing with a heavier than water product. So all of our good water is on the surface. So we're getting the water flow, the clean, trying to keep the volume from backing up. So again, we may need to add more pipes if need be based on the volume. But all of our contaminant is now on the bottom of the stream bed. One way that we can help to collect that is go behind our dam and actually dig down deeper, acting much like a retention pond, a deeper area for that contaminant to collect in, which will make it easier when the cleanup company comes in to clean the product up. Uh, we left our spill pad on the, on the surface here, even though we're dealing with a heavier than water chemical. But you can see, as I mentioned before, the water that is kind of bubbled up on top of the absorbent pad. It's a good indication of it's not absorbing the water, but it will absorb the contaminant. Okay, again, back to ecosystems. So to help reduce the, uh, the human impact uh, with, uh, with pollution, um, when we have a fuel spill or, or any kind of spill, even like I said, if it was a milk truck uh, going into the aquatic system, which could mess it up, we would have another absorbent material. And so basically it's a, it's a fancy kitty litter. And what this will do is it will absorb the chemicals or the fluid and then we can sweep it and, and, and rake it up and put it in, and discard it, put it in the trash. Uh, they come in these bags on the fire trucks. We typically keep them in pails. And so what we'll do, if you ever see a, a vehicle collision and you see firefighters out there and they got this bucket, and we'll take this stuff and we'll kind of throw it out like, like chicken feed. And what's that doing? It spreads it out to absorb all the fluid. And so we'll use that and then we'll sweep it up to, uh, to clean up the area. Now, what we got here is we're gonna simulate that this is gonna get into one of the, uh, the stream basins. And so, we'll come up with a tarp. A 
Okay, Jonathan will cover the, cover the drain with a tarp. We can lay the bags of absorbent on there. And of course, you can take a knife and, and slice the bag once it's in place to open up the absorbent. Love would bring in the absorbent. Boom here, and he'd lay it out. And so that right there will help slow uh, the pollution from getting into the, uh, the waterway or the water table. So uh, Wes here is going to discuss some more uh, alternative uses to control and contain. So here the yellow pool that we've got here is nothing more than a kick pool. So if we do have a vehicle accident that, uh, where vehicles have crashed and they're leaking any type of fluid, whether it be uh, antifreeze, oil, uh, fuel that propels the vehicle, uh, we can, in the initial stages, catch that product in these pools. And so that helps keep it from getting to that point. But during the time frame of response, uh, it may get to that point before we get to it. But once we get there, this is a way that we can contain that product into this, so whenever things all said and done, the cleanup company comes out, they can discard this uh, contaminant, and we've captured it before it got to uh, the storm drain, or at least kept it minimal of what's got to the storm drain. Also here, uh, as Captain Warren's opening up this red box, chemical spills do not always happen outside. They can also begin uh, inside of a building or a structure. So if it originates from a pipe or a network of pipes, uh, here he is showing us uh, some things that we carry on our hazmat uh, response truck that we have the ability to go in, uh, if it is a pipe system, we can plug these things into those pipe systems uh, very carefully trying to stay out of the product. Um, but it gives us the ability to offload that product. As you can see there, the, uh, the brass spouts uh, on those internal plugs. So basically we just tighten those up from an engineering aspect. Uh, it goes inside uh, the plug and whenever you tighten it down those flanges get wider. So it actually builds up uh, pressure on the internal wall of the pipe system. It would squeeze, the, these, these rings would squeeze down yep. and make the rubber expand. And then it gives us the ability to hook our hose onto these and we can pipe that off into another container to capture. Uh, also inside of a structure, uh, we have uh, sometimes you have a system that uh, a series of drains in the floor. Uh, you may see them inside of a, a concrete floor. So this is nothing more than a neoprene pad. Uh, it's 36 by 36. You can see it's very flimsy, has a very tacky feeling to it. We can lay that over the, the drain in the floor and it will adhere to the floor and it will seal off that drain keeping the product from getting into that storm drain or to the floor drain that will lead into the sewer system. So this gives us the ability to capture and minimize the flow of that product uh, as much as possible. And